This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. A pristine natural environment sounds idyllic if you're on a planet that's naturally lush green and blue, but if your planet is just red, dusty, and airless, nature is going to need some warmth. You and I live in an era when even a single human boot print on Mars would be a historic accomplishment, one that we hope with fingers crossed will happen in our lifetime. However, there may come a time when Mars is no longer a frontier but is thoroughly colonized and populated, Martian babies will be born, and some Martian adults will live their whole lives without ever visiting Earth. The geology of Mars will be surveyed thoroughly and completely quite early on, and preserving its pristine state will become less important than making Mars a better place for Martians to live. The process of making a planet more Earth-like has long been known as terraforming, terra meaning Earth, a term by the way that originated in science fiction before making its way into science. You can of course never really perfectly duplicate a place, nor is it really desirable even where you can. And as channel regulars know, we have a lot of alternatives for finding extra living space, such as O'Neill cylinders, and that's often been our focus for colonizing and when we do discuss colonizing plants on the show, it's typically more about how we go about using them and living on them in comfort, rather than genuinely terraforming them to be near-earth copies. Today though, we'll look at how we go about doing just that. And while in many cases a difference between Mars and Earth would not be worth the trouble to alter, like its year length and surface gravity, we nevertheless will bring up the option for changing even those things today. Since there are a lot of factors and options, many of which we have discussed in more detail in other places, I'll toss out references to those if you want more details. Beyond that, grab a drink and a snack and let's get to it. I think there's this general notion that you'd start terraforming Mars from one of those early bases, and slowly doming areas over will do something that ends the planet all blue and green. This is really not how you terraform a planet, and indeed that doming approach, if you're just expanding by adding dome after dome, is what we call para-terraforming. You could have bases down on the planet that you could keep intact through terraforming, but you don't settle a planet while you're terraforming it any more than you start hanging up curtains and moving furniture into a skyscraper penthouse apartment while they're still bulldozing and putting in the foundation. Key concept, terraforming is ultra destructive. You could make structures that could weather the storm, very literally, as you reshape that world at a fundamental level, but it's actually rather unlikely you'd terraform a planet you'd already settled in a major way. Just for context, Earth's got over a billion cubic kilometers of water in its ocean, and likely more down in the mantle, and while Mars has less surface area than Earth, that's about the right zone for what you need to truck in if you want great deep oceans like we have here. You haven't got that in its polar ice caps, and while those, if melted, would easily supply domes across the whole world, That's because you may only need the equivalent of a meter's depth of water, not kilometers. If you truck that in as comets, it would mean dropping several million comets of a size with Halley's Comet on Mars, which is actually a bit bigger than the asteroid we think killed the dinosaurs. If you were trying to accomplish that in a mere thousand years, it would mean dropping such a comet on Mars several times a day. Now of course you could break those up just before they hit so they'd burn up more easily in the atmosphere, which Mars doesn't really have much of yet, but I should note that quantity and rate would mean you got around a meter or a few feet of rainfall each year just from that, forgetting about any normal rain being made by evaporation. So if you want to give Mars water faster than that, not taking many centuries to do it, you better be ready for non-stop torrential rain along with all the erosion and mudslides accompanying it. Or you better be ready for some serious mega engineering, like docking those comets in orbit at a host of orbital rings and slicing them up for transport down to places they can melt rather than plumbing down as ice, snow, or epically large hailstones. Just to put a scare to that, 
Freight trains typically carry a few kilotons of cargo, so it would take a few hundred thousand of them to move a cubic kilometer or gigaton of water or ice. And if you're trying for one a day, you've got thousands of trains constantly coming down from orbit and around the ground, hauling ice, and they complete that project in a mere million years or so. These options probably sound the next best thing to impossible, and if you're new to the channel is why we so often suggest building things like O'Neill Cylinders instead, and why most terraforming plans call for a very modest approach. If you're curious by the way, we've identified about 5 million cubic kilometers of ice on Mars, which sounds like a lot, and again it is if you're going the shallow lakes and domes route. My own beloved Lake Erie, just a stone's throw from home, is only 500 cubic kilometers, and so that's enough to make 10,000 such lakes, but it's only a little more than is in the Mediterranean Sea. When terraforming planets will often be confronted by what is good enough, where that's obviously a subjective concept and where trying to exceed that to truly replicate something Earth-like might require a million times more effort. Two really good examples of that are day length and surface gravity. Mars's day is quite close to Earth's, indeed there's no planet closer to it, being a mere 37 minutes longer than ours, and it is longer which means you get an extra 37 minutes of sleep, something few of us would object to, but that could be sped up, and is hardly a high-tech process, simply Olympian in effort. You're talking about needing to add several thousand, trillion, trillion joules of rotational energy, but if you're dumping lots of ice down on a planet at orbital velocities, each gram having several thousand joules of energy on entry, a trillion, trillion grams would do the trick, which happens to be a billion cubic kilometers of ice, our rough target number for proper deep oceans. You just have to aim it all to hit in the same direction so as to add rotation, rather than randomly hitting at every angle. It doesn't exactly require precise timing and coordination to get a giant slab of ice to hit a planet in about the right spot. Incidentally, if you had a planet that spun a bit too fast, shorter days, you could do this backwards in entry direction to slow it down, and I suspect that would be a more likely terraforming scenario too, as few would object to an extra hour of sleep but would resent a 23 hour day. Remember the scale of that effort though, and ask if you really need deep oceans and an exactly 24 hour day, or if lots of nice lakes and shallow seas, and an extra 37 minutes in bed is enough. I suspect most folks will say yes, even in some post-scarcity high automation civilization where robots do all the grunt work, since even if humans aren't spending millennia doing the actual lifting, they do have to wait for the robots to do it instead. A thousand years is a long time to wait on your contractor to finish the perfect job when you can get something 99% as good done in 1% of the cost and time, even if cost doesn't matter to you. The same applies to altering surface gravity, only scaled up far far more. As heavy as our oceans are, or would need to be to match that for Mars, you'd still need to bring in around a thousand times that mass to bring the gravity up to snuff. Martian gravity is only 38% of Earth normal, and no you couldn't dump asteroids on it, because the whole asteroid belt wouldn't even make a sizable dent in the amount you needed. You couldn't equal Earth's mass if you used every moon and asteroid in the solar system. Indeed all three other rocky planets combined, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, still mass just a bit less than Earth and it would seem rather wasteful to jam them and a few of our larger moons together to make a single planet. You could do that of course, and if you're shoving all that stuff together, you could arrange to make the new Earth as far from the Sun as our own, but on the opposite side, a counter-Earth, which has been a popular idea in science fiction, especially before we had satellites far enough from Earth to take a peek at what's behind the Sun. Needless to say, this is very destructive to the local real estate even by terraforming standards. You could do it slowly, but if you're adding a meter a day of new rock to that world, you are talking about centuries of folks going out and sweeping and shoveling. I'm willing to believe folks might be willing to put up with heavy rainfall and perpetual clouds for centuries, especially if we picked our settlers from places like Seattle or London. 
You might even get a few adventurous souls hoping to imitate Noah and willing to live there for an expedited process of constant torrential rain for many years, but I'm thinking having it rain dirt for centuries would be a non-starter for anyone trying to sell houses there. So again, we have to ask, what is good enough? Now we do have some tricks for sourcing that much matter, and actually needing less to achieve the right gravity, that involve using artificial black holes dumped into the middle of the planet, as we discussed in Colonizing Black Holes, or ripping the planet apart to reform it into a shell around a gaseous interior, but those are about the only sane ways to bring gravity up to Earth norm for Mars. Also, I love running a channel where dumping a black hole on a planet or ripping it apart to make a big shell world can be referred to as sane without the slightest trace of sarcasm. However, there's a decent chance humans and flora and fauna and pets and parasites can live comfortably in Martian gravity without any real modification at all, and such modifications, genetic or cybernetic, are certainly not off the table as pragmatic options. Even for things like hosting a solar system series of baseball or football, where you want the gravity the same as Earth to avoid arguments over home team advantage and records, you do have options like making a big, deep bowl shaped stadium and spinning it, to combine local and spin gravity to achieve the Earth norm, and cities could be made as such too. In the absence of the right gravity, you've also got the problem with the right atmosphere, getting it thick enough and made of the right stuff and keeping it from flying away. That last is not actually a gravity problem. More gravity helps for keeping atmospheres longer, they all leak incidentally, even ours, but it mostly comes down to a lack of a real magnetosphere. With that, Mars could hoard an atmosphere, and even our Moon probably could. But there's more to it than simply dumping air down or baking oxygen out of the rocks. In this case, it isn't such a big issue for transport though. Air does have weight, but it is pretty light compared to things like oceans. Trucking in air from other places is no mean feat, but this is an example where going beyond good enough isn't that restrictive. A couple notes, Mars has plenty of oxygen, oxygen is the third most plentiful element in the Universe, and it's easy to forget that just about everything we think of as rock or dirt has a ton of oxygen in it. A third of Earth's mass is oxygen, and very little of that is in our air, and any rocky object will be similar, and any icy object is almost entirely oxygen, as H2O might be two hydrogen and one oxygen, but oxygen masses 16 times as much as hydrogen and makes up 89% of the mass of water. So you don't need to bring oxygen in for air, but most of what we call air is nitrogen. No, we don't need that to breathe, but our plants do. You can pressurize domes to normal Earth atmosphere even though they're only a few meters, not kilometers high, and thus use very little nitrogen, which Mars hasn't got a lot of as best as we can tell. But if you want to grow plants outdoors, you need that nitrogen in bulk, and probably need to raid Venus or Titan for it. Now you also don't need full pressure to walk around in, Indeed we routinely under-pressurize spacesuits so they leak less, leakage is always faster the bigger the pressure difference on the sides of a crack or seam. So we go with pure oxygen a lot for suit mixes, and a lower pressure inside that suit. But if you want that regular pressure and air on Mars, you actually need to use more air per unit of surface area than Earth has, as pressure outside a sealed suit or can is essentially weight of air over you, and the same mass of air on Mars has less weight. So you need more air to get the same pressure, and since there is less gravity yanking it down, it's going to rise up even higher towards space than our atmosphere does. Another option is to use a denser mix of gases, possibly using a gas like sulfur hexafluoride, which is an inert, non-toxic gas that is a potent greenhouse gas and is five times heavier than air. It also has the effect of lowering the tone of your voice, which may mean we come to think of Martians, which live in such an atmosphere, as having deep voices. That is going to result in some very different weather patterns, but they'd still be fairly analogous to Earth especially in contrast to the current weather there, which is dust storms. 
It also means all of your orbiting objects need to orbit higher not to be getting dragged on by the atmosphere, and furthermore, it also negates some of the advantage Mars has over Earth to a spacefaring civilization, since its low gravity and minimal atmosphere make launching from ground to orbit much easier. You need to launch higher and through more air, though it would still be easier than on Earth. Of course speaking of orbits, and of weather, which is largely driven by the Sun, which Mars gets less of, we should talk about the orbital infrastructure that has to come with terraforming Mars. One critical difference in colonizing planets as opposed to getting off one, you always build your orbital infrastructure up before and during building your civilization up, not after as we did here on Earth. It's easier to get into the orbit of Mars than to land there. Truth be told, it makes more sense to put a space station around Mars or on one of its tiny moons before we set our base up on Mars, though I can't imagine us bringing ourselves to make the long trip there to drop off a station then follow that up with a later mission to plant a flag down on the surface. Key point though, if you're doing big stuff down on Mars, you're doing it with a space and orbital industry in play and in a big way so you might as well look to that for options for dealing with the magnetosphere and low temperatures. Folks like to ask about drilling a hole down into the Martian core and setting off nukes to spin its core up to make a magnetosphere, and honestly that's not a logical approach, especially as you're talking about setting down so many nukes to get that job done that it would make the whole Cold War arsenal look like a package of firecrackers. While that's admittedly not that big a deal when we're talking about trucking in whole oceans, it's still overkill for no effect. As it turns out, we actually know how to make magnetic fields without using a billion trillion tons of spinning molten metal, and an electromagnet around the planet or place between Mars and the Sun at the Lagrange point is an option. There's often a desire in fiction or discussions of the future to make a terraformed planet somehow absent of technology after the process is done, and I think that's part of the objection folks often have about orbital habitats like the O'Neill Cylinder too, but an artificial magnetic field like that, even if it broke down, would not result in the planet outgassing its atmosphere in mere minutes or even centuries. There was more than enough time to fix the problem, even if somehow things got so bad that a handful of survivors had to rebuild and repopulate the planet and rediscover the technology too. Terraformed planets are going to require maintenance too, and the more Terran you want the place, the more maintenance is going to be needed, even for stuff like the local ecology. If you're wondering about how much power it takes to run a magnet around Mars, or put a big magnet at the Martian L1 point with the Sun, the usual figure is about a gigawatt, which is fairly trivial even by modern standards, let alone that of any civilization thinking about transporting many quadrillions of tons of matter to a planet or dumping millions of megaton atomic devices down into its core and whose uranium or plutonium could easily run that magnet's power plant for millions of years. Of course there's also a giant fusion plant on hand too, with the sun right there, and that's a handy thing since giving Mars enough light to be comfortably warm will take way more juice. It's a popular notion to suggest we could just release a lot of greenhouse gases there to raise temperatures, but that's a non-ideal patch. Just as a reminder, Carbon dioxide in large concentrations has a lesser known effect of making the people breathing it into lethargic morons, and it kind of defeats the purpose of terraforming a planet if you need a breathing mask and air scrubber when outside. Other greenhouse gases are certainly options, but water for instance, while a great greenhouse gas, has this tendency to form clouds and to fall down, and if you're aiming for high concentrations, that rather spoils the option of going on walks on the Martian lands or having a picnic. Methane is a great greenhouse gas, and is actually odorless, it just tends to be produced by processes that aren't. It's also flammable. We have plenty of others like ozone or nitrous oxide, but my feeling is that folks would not want any of these in their air in large enough quantities if there was an alternative. Which there is. The notion of building a great big lens at the Martian L1, or a whole lot of orbiting mirrors, can strike people as a huge effort, but it really isn't. Indeed it's probably the easiest manufacturing process involved in the whole terraforming effort, as mirrors and lenses are very thin things. 
we were talking about dropping many millions of cubic kilometers of water and air on the planet. In contrast, a meal as thick as the one in your bathroom, but with a volume of a single cubic kilometer of glass or aluminum, would fold out to be as big as most countries, and we can make meals a heck of a lot thinner than the one hanging on your wall or medicine cabinet. Not that you'd make a single meal or lens, you'd do a ton of them, and you'd have to be replacing, repolishing, or recycling them occasionally, but I'd be surprised if it took as much effort to build and maintain enough of those to heat Mars up to tropic weather and keep them up till the sun expanded to produce that effect on its own in a few billion years took anything like as much effort as trucking in all that air and water did. And if you're putting in all this orbital and Lagrange point infrastructure, you might as well put in power satellites and keep your industries mostly up in orbit, no point to spoiling the planet you just invested huge amounts of effort into turning green. It's also way easier and faster than moving the planet. Of course it's not springtime on Mars unless you've got trees and grass blooming new leaves and flowers, and that takes us back to the ground because we also have to make all of our soil. This is another case where what we can do in domes is a lot easier than planet wide and in the open. Given sufficient mastery of biotechnology, we can probably tailor us up some life forms that could cheerfully live in a vacuum stuck to the side of a desolate airless asteroid, so cooking up something that can live on Mars is almost certainly doable long before we have sufficient power and automation to be thinking about these kind of mega engineering approaches to terraforming we've discussed today. That does require advanced tech, whereas most of what we've discussed thus far does not. It's huge but simple like the pyramids or the Great Wall of China. In a dome, you can pressurize and light it and mix up some basic dirt that's not toxic for plants to live in. While the gravity is lower, we already know plants do fine in lower gravity, but things change when you're talking about an open and planet-wide ecology. We can't ignore all the biogeochemical cycles that help us deal with a lot of the nutrients flowing out of the dirt and into the bottoms of the ocean. We can't ignore that the rock on Mars is not chemically the same as what it is on Earth, and not something you could just throw in a box with air and water and light and some seeds and microbiota and expect to get healthy plants from. You are going to have to make every last inch of soil on that planet, and you might decide the easiest and most sustainable approach is to plow up several meters everywhere you go. Throw that into giant mobile separators to get the basic chemistry and soil particle sizes and shapes right, dump it into huge bioreactors full of nutrient and bacteria, bake down a layer of ceramic or foil to act as a liner to keep lower layers of Mars from contaminating that new soil, then dump that slurry back down again in layers as you start getting plants and roots in there so all the stuff doesn't mudslide on you as you start the weather and rains going. Again, terraforming is a very destructive process even when done right, especially if you want to do it fast, and since even fast is a process of centuries, that's probably the path you'll go, especially since you are not going to even try terraforming planets unless you've got so much power and automation that you don't really need to try to be frugal about manpower. Keep in mind though, that's why we often say rotating habitats are better since, ironically, it's actually easier to build and terraform a big metal can than a genuine existing planet, even adjusting for the size differential of living area. You go beyond domes, you're going all in for a project that will dwarf any endeavor we've ever done before, and indeed probably all of them combined, before you ever see your first oak tree blossoming there that hasn't been so gene-hacked that it probably has less relation to a terrestrial oak tree than you or I do. We can't ignore all the ecological cycles that even once in place in simple form are not going to mimic Earth too well. A tree might grow just fine in low Martian gravity, indeed it might grow far better and get you trees that sneered at little redwoods, but that sort of thing really affects all the ecology going on under its majestic branches and canopy. You can probably force it to mimic Earth, but this is an example where not only would good enough tend to come into play, but likely be viewed as a bonus feature. There's probably a trillion plants out there in the galaxy that are as amenable to terraforming as Mars is, 
and doubtless at least many thousands, will be close enough to Earth in almost every variable of lighting, gravity, calendar, etc. that most folks wouldn't notice without careful measure. So for all the others, why bother making carbon copies? Better perhaps to make every planet unique, where you terraform only the low hanging fruit or those aspects we really need to feel at home, once we've adjusted to our new home, mentally, or even physiologically. In that light of course, we might often find that expediting our own adaptations, or going beyond what evolution or even biology would permit, might be a path that is easier or offers us more uniqueness options than terraforming, what we call bioforming. And of course that's something we arguably already have done extensively with a lot of life on Earth, even our best friend, the dog, just ask the poodle. But for Mars, the first world we think to terraform, and arguably our closest sandbox to experiment and perfect our technique on, I think we can't really all say we've terraformed it, brought spring to a desolate and dead world, until any regular old modern human could take their regular old modern dog out on the Martian prairies and forests with a frisbee in a picnic basket and in no more gear than a t-shirt, shorts, and a hat. For me, that's good enough. And while getting there would take a long time, and an incredible amount of work, as we are essentially building an entire world, as we saw today, it can be done, if we want it bad enough. We were talking today about how you'd need to generate a magnetosphere on Mars to keep the air in and adjust pressure, and how that's going to work out as a thicker and taller atmosphere than on Earth because of the lower gravity. Things like this can be counterintuitive sometimes, and it helps to have a background in the sciences to grasp it, and if you want to learn more about pressure and how it works, there's a good quiz on it over at Brilliant, as well as courses on magnetics if you want to understand how those help keep atmospheres in, and how much energy it would take to run one for a whole planet. Brilliant is a problem solving website and app with a hands-on approach, with over 50 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. All of their courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve, and you can even download these courses to take offline with their mobile apps. If you'd like to learn more science, math, and computer science, go to brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link we'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription so you can solve all the daily challenges in the archives and access dozens of problem solving courses. So next week we'll be celebrating SFIA's 5th anniversary by returning to one of our favorite topics, the Fermi Paradox, to look at the role that extinction might play in either limiting the number of intelligent civilizations that arise or ending them after they've arisen as galactic players. The week after that, we'll return to the Alien Civilization series to look at the popular concept of Ascended Aliens or other examples where an advanced civilization might simply lose interest in our Universe, or at least its more primitive occupants, in Aloof Aliens. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. And if you'd like to support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or our website, IsaacArthur.net, linked in the video description below. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.